Hello there, this is Dr. Kramer. For this lecture, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. There's no need to take notes on any of this material and it won't be anywhere on a test. However, I am giving you a lecture on Twelfth Night, not only to increase your understanding as you read Acts 3, 4, and 5, but also to demonstrate how you might organize a literary analysis, a research literary analysis on a topic of literature. I have also put this paper on Canvas so that you can peruse it and go back and look, see how I've done things. I'm basically going to read it. Now there may be a few little changes in wording or natural things that happen when someone is reading something they've written. And it's not a perfect paper. I wrote it less than 24 hours ago and so I've only gone over it again a few times. So please forgive any typos or any other stray errors. Like you, I sometimes make them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start my paper now. Um, you can for sure follow along on the paper if you'd like. And um, so here we go. The title of this paper is Friendship First, Toppling the Petrarchan Love Paradigm in Twelfth Night. From Shakespeare's Sonnet 147, lines 9 through 12. Past cure I am, now reason is past care and frantic mad with evermore unrest. My thoughts and my discourse as madmen's are, at random from the truth, vainly expressed. In Shakespeare's sonnet 147, the speaker describes the damage love has caused him. He is past care and frantic mad. His very thinking and speaking have become random and vainly expressed. Sonnet 147 employs the love as disease trope, first popularized by Petrarch. This lovesick character does not just reside in Shakespeare's sonnets, but he also makes an appearance in plays. Characters like Romeo and Hamlet take on aspects of the Petrarchan lover suffering from melancholia, and in Twelfth Night, the playwright creates another Petrarchan lover in Duke Orsino, who pines away for the fair Olivia. Orsino persists in his lovesickness, but Viola, in the guise of the page Cesario, encourages Orsino to put aside his unrequited love and instead look to someone who might love him back. Although modern audiences may be surprised by Orsino's proposal immediately upon learning that Cesario is a woman, Shakespeare has been setting up this marriage to be a success from their first encounter. Viola's cross-dressing allows her to become Orsino's true friend, and thus in Twelfth Night, Shakespeare argues that if love is going to be fulfilling, Lovers must abandon Petrarchan love melancholia and create a kind of passionate friendship with their potential spouses that Renaissance men enjoyed with each other. Twelfth Night demonstrates that Petrarchan idealism is harmful and should be abandoned in favor of friendship. The first character to the, introduced to the audience, Duke Orsino, is a melancholic lover if ever there was one. And in this, he echoes one of Petrarch's most persistent themes. Love is suffering. In fact, Orsino revels in his misery, declaring aloud his lovesickness, while at the same time longing for a cure. The very first words of the play are, or are Orsino's, who exclaims, If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. That surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. Orsino encourages his musicians here, and Festi, the fool later on, to feed his love with music until he has been satiated, in the hopes that he will be cured from his mistress's refusals. And yet, Orsino acknowledges that love receiveth as the sea, from Act 1, Scene 1, Line 11, and, quote, is all hungry as the sea and can digest as much, from Act 2, Scene 4, Lines 99 through 100. Love, like the ocean, is equally all-consuming and destructive, with Orsino inadvertently pointing towards Viola's own shipwreck after a wild storm. Additionally, Orsino's comparison between his emotions and the sea brings up an interesting point of consideration, that Orsino's love melancholy is essentially sterile and self-induced, a state of mind dependent upon that very absence and lack of response from Olivia which it affects to lament. Orsino and Olivia communicate through intermediaries. And the audience does not know when the last time Orsino saw Olivia. 
the duke does not even confront her directly until the play's last scene sending first valentine the name is surely not a coincidence and later cesario to do his wooing for him like petrarch who continued to write sonnets to a woman who was unavailable first because of marriage and later because of death orsino chooses to love someone who will not be loved who cannot be wooed thus ensuring the continuance of his unhealthy obsession shakespeare juxtaposes orsino's lack of romantic success and love melancholia against his blossoming friendship with his page cesario thus revealing that for the duke male friendships bring more emotional closeness than heterosexual romance it is to cesario that orsino reveals his inner thoughts most completely sending every one away in act two scene four before confessing the depths of his supposed love for olivia when staging act two scene four many modern-day directors include a kiss between orsino and cesario at this point sealing the emotional closeness with an outward expression of affection usually reserved for the opposite sex in the renaissance male friendship often took on overtones that today would be labeled homoerotic or even homosexual this type of friendship known as amity represented friendship as an identity premised upon the value of same-sex love which codified passionate behaviors between men shakespeare himself illustrates the state of affairs in sonnet twenty part of the fair youth sequence where the speaker addresses the subject as quote, the master mistress of my passion close quote. today's interpreter might be tempted to label shakespeare or at the very least the sonnet speaker as gay but many renaissance scholars argue that the sociological concept gay did not exist in this pre-psychoanalytic period if by the term gay you mean an identity that one assumes as a result of a certain sexual attraction to members of the same sex it is not this paper's purpose to illustrate sorry to queer the text of twelfth night although there is certainly ample material however i argue the play illustrates passionate male-to-male -male friendships in order to advocate the recreation of those friendships as heterosexual marriages these passionate male friendships must contain an inequality of sorts between friends a feature that shakespeare employs in twelfth night to create emotional dependence and desire sebastian and antonio the sea captain who rescues sebastian from the wreck at sea illustrate this phenomenon when sebastian decides after three months in antonio's company that he must leave and grieve for his lost sister completely he confesses his true name and parentage to his friend because antonio is from a lower class this revelation shifts the relationship from the necessary reciprocity or mutuality of philia to the disjunction of eros in other words antonio and sebastian had enjoyed each other's company as equals and loved each other as friends philia but the moment sebastian divulges that his father quote, was that sebastian of messaline whom i know you have heard of close quote in act two scene one lines fifteen through sixteen their relationship becomes an erotic although not necessarily sexual one antonio realizes his own inferior position and cries out if you will not murder me for my love let me be your servant indicating that separation from sebastian would be the death of him in this antonio displays some petrarchan tropes of love as disease and yet there is more intensity and realism behind his declaration because of his emotional closeness with sebastian switching into poetry at the end of the scene antonio declares his love i do adore thee so that danger shall seem sport he clearly means what he says giving sebastian all his money so that he can explore illyria where there happens to be a bounty on antonio's head intervening in cesario's duel with sir andrew though he takes cesario to be sebastian here and expressing his hurt at sebastian's apparent betrayal so feelingly that cesario is prompted to announce methinks his words do from such passion fly that he believes himself cesario expresses antonio's care for sebastian in vocabulary later writers would reserve for heterosexual relationships and his selfless love for sebastian finds echo in cesario's love for her master the duke given the depth of male friendship in the time period and in the play itself it is only by cross-dressing as a boy that viola can acquire the kind of emotional closeness with the object of her desire the duke 
Though Viola had no designs on Orsino's affections when she sought employment in his court, she swiftly falls in love with him. Orsino, of course, is infatuated with Olivia. Viola must uncouple him from his Petrarchan delusions and direct his emotional attention towards herself, even if she must employ the costume of a boy to do so. When Orsino is waxing poetical about Olivia's cruelty, it is Viola who tries to bring him back down to earth in this short exchange. Sorry about that. This short exchange. But if she cannot love you, sir, I cannot be so answered. Sooth, but you must. Inhabiting the guise of a concerned male friend, Viola as Cesario counsels Orsino to let slip away his idealized Petrarchan Laura and turn his attention to the woman who may hath for your love a great pang of heart as you have for Olivia. Act 2, Scene 4, Lines 89-90. through 90. It is through her Cesario persona that Viola can teach Orsino about women's feelings and prepare him for accepting her as a potential mate. A male friend can make some headway with another man where a woman cannot. Therefore, Viola cannot ignite Orsino's love for her unless he first treats her as a passionate friend. When Cesario argues with him that women can feel as deeply as men, Orsino listens for once. He puts aside his own love madness to hear the sad tale of Cesario's quote-unquote sister, and Cesario uses Petrarchan language to describe his sister's feelings because that is the best way to make Orsino understand. See this exchange, where Viola explains, her sister pined in thought, and with a green and yellow melancholy, she sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. We see Orsino's conception of a woman's feelings undergo a significant change after hearing of Cesario's sister, where at the beginning of the scene Orsino was dismissing women's hearts for not being capable of such strong passions as men's hearts, he now asked, But died your sister of her love, my boy? Viola, as Cesario, is already effecting a change in the Duke, and interaction with Cesario as another human being dismantles Orsino's self-centeredness and pierces his most cherished image of the lover, and thus of himself. As a male friend and one in a servant's position, like Antonio to Sebastian, Viola is able to topple the Petrarchan paradigm and forge instead the passionate friendship that carried so much capital among Renaissance men and lay the groundwork for a different kind of heterosexual relationship. By emphasizing the friendship that Viola and Orsino create, a friendship made possible because of Viola's cross-dressing, Shakespeare echoes the marriage discussions of his day. Humanist thinkers like Erasmus began taking seriously the problems of marriage and of women, and these humanists began advocating for a different kind of marriage, termed companionate marriage, by scholars. Elizabeth I's own Master of Revels, Edmund Tilney, wrote an advice book on marriage in 1568 entitled The Flower of Friendship, which argues that marriage should be a friendship between equals. His character, Master Pedro, exclaims that... For perfect love knitteth loving hearts in an insoluble knot of amity, wherefore it must be true and perfect love that maketh the flower of friendship between a man and wife freshly to spring. Tilney uses the same word, amity, that was usually reserved for male relationships, and argues that true love is friendship, not Petrarchan worship. As master of revels, Tilney approved plays for presentation at court and perhaps wanting to flatter the very government official in charge of licensing, licensing plays, Shakespeare illustrates in Twelfth Night an idea already in circulation during the latter half of the 1500s. Orsino and Cesario become passionate friends before Orsino and Viola can become marriage partners. When Orsino accepts Viola's femaleness so easily and offers her his hand in marriage so readily in Act Five, it can come as a jolt to modern audiences perhaps confused by how male friendship can turn to heterosexual marriage so quickly. The answer is that Viola and Orsino have already formed the perfect love by first creating amity in their male friendship. Viola's cross-dressing is the vehicle by which Orsino can leave off his Petrarchan ideals and embrace the humanist view of companionate marriage between friends. 
Orsino's Petrarchan condition may be improving, but he is not yet totally cured. Once he learns that his dear boy is really a girl in disguise, Orsino cannot help but revert somewhat to his old Petrarchan ways, exclaiming, When in other habits you are seen, Orsino's mistress and his fancy's queen. Although the duke is reverting somewhat to his idealizing ways, the audience trusts that Viola, a more practical romantic, will keep him from the excess of melancholia he experienced in his unrequited love for Olivia. Anne Barton has noted, if Shakespeare christened a comedy, comedy Twelfth Night, it seems reasonable to assume that she intended that title to summon images of epiphany as it was kept in, her, in his own time period, a period of holiday abandon in which the normal rules and order of life were suspended or else deliberately inverted. Orsino's epiphany is that women can be friends, an epiphany made possible by Viola's Twelfth Night inversion of gender norms. Her carnival disguise allowed her to build amity first before marriage became a possibility. This passionate friendship of companions will prove a more stable platform for marriage than the restless, hungry sea of Petrarchan lovesickness, which would only consume and not uplift them. All right, that's the end of my paper, which you can see this, the script of, or the text, if you will, on um, Canvas. And I'll link it on the Unit 8 overview page, as well as putting it underneath the essay module. Um, I would just like to point out a few um, works cited here, or the fact that I have a work cited. Some of your sources that you use may be very similar to these, so I've put them all here. Um, this first one that you see, the Ann Barton, that's the introduction to um, kind of an anthology of Shakespeare that I have at home called the Riverside Shakespeare. If you're going to use material from the um, anthology, from the Norton anthology, to kind of give some background, you are welcome to do so. This is how you would cite it. Okay, it's also how you would cite, you know, the work from the anthology, which I'll show you a little later. This second citation, Casey Charles, this is an example of an article from a database. So um, you can find this kind of template online at OWL, Purdue OWL, but I just thought I'd put it here as well. Um, now I have um, the direct, several directors here, Ian Judge here, this one, and then uh, Christopher Luscombe here. That's because of some pictures that I include in the actual text version of this paper. I want to make it very clear that you do not need to include text versions, but because I have that point that I made about director staging the scene, Act 2, Scene 4, that often includes a kiss in modern times, I thought that I needed to put in some kind of proof of that, and so that's what those are for. Um, and also that's where some of those pictures are from. All right. Um, and then a couple of these are actual books. If you have several works by the same author, you see I have several Shakespeare um, sources here, um, including two sonnets and then the play. Um, this is how you would cite those. There's a difference, things that are short, like a short story or a poem you put in quotes. If it's a longer poem like Beowulf or even Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, then you're going to do it like my Twelfth Night entry where you italicize the title. Okay, so those are just a few things to point out as you um, peruse this work cited and then the paper itself is there for you to see as well. Just a warning I use, I have a fake student that I've had with me since the 1990s, Gertrude von Klunkel, and so I always put her names on my example papers, but the work is mine. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed the second part of Twelfth Night.